Good afternoon, and welcome to today's VetNet Entrepreneurship Track presentation, where we will be discussing naming and branding. My name is Michael Shenick, and I'm the program manager for VetNet here at the Institute for Veterans and Military Families at Syracuse University. If you have questions during today's presentation, please follow, follow the following directions. For those of you watching live, please feel free to speak up or to type your question out in the comment box on the right of the presentation. For those of you watching on YouTube, please type them out in the comment box to the right of the video. And as always, you can post them in the live event of the G Plus page, and I'll make sure that they are addressed. At this point, I would like to introduce Robert, or Bob Frank, PhD and President of Illuminor LLC, who will be leading today's presentation. And I will turn things over to him. Bob, before we get started into the PowerPoint, why don't you tell us uh, a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join this group. Uh, I have been in the trademark research business for about 30 years. Uh, I've been an entrepreneur almost uh, probably 50 years of my life. And um, I provide research services and expert witness testimony for law firms in trademark infringement cases. Uh, I've been doing that for about 10 years. Prior to that, I owned a trademark research firm in New York, and we did about 20,000 uh, name clearance projects a year uh, prior to when I sold the company. Um, so that's a general introduction. I'm well known in the trademark industry. I'm well uh, associated with various uh, government agencies and organizations that are involved with trademark management and trademark rights. Um, one of the first things I do have to tell you all though is that I am not a lawyer. You're going to see the little note on the bottom of the uh, screen there. I'm not an attorney and therefore I can't provide uh, legal advice to you uh, and charge you a fee for that. Uh, I can only provide business advice. Uh, what I do for all the lay people I work with is I do provide a business advice and if you do need legal advice I'll help you get to an attorney or work with you on an attorney, uh, getting an attorney that works well for you. Uh, but I'll answer any questions you have because nobody's paying me for any of this today. So you, it's one of those things you get what you pay for I guess. Uh, let's go ahead and we're going to talk about naming and branding. Let's go ahead on to the next slide. I'm going to give you some overview stuff about intellectual property first and then we'll get into the trademark specifics after that. There's four kinds of intellectual property. Uh, people always get them confused and so I want to try to straighten those out at the beginning. Uh, the first one we're going to look at real quickly is a patent and patents cover inventions and product designs. And so examples of a patent would have been an intermittent windshield wiper, which a gentleman did create at one stage and took him about 10 years before he ever got the royalties for that. Or you could have what's called a design patent, which would be something such as the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle, a shape of a product that we all become very familiar with. Copyrights cover written works, such as blueprints, uh, pictures, photographs, books, and magazines. Completely different area than patents. The third area is called trade secrets, and those are corporate uh, confidential information. The one we all think of most is the Coca-Cola secret formula. Um, that is something that obviously is never published to the public. Uh, and uh, the fourth kind is trademarks, a uh, fourth type of intellectual property. And trademarks cover, as it says, names, logos, or packaging designs, as well as shapes of products. Uh, they are an indicator of source or origin, and that's a key phrase to keep in mind. They're an indicator of the source or origin of a product. And examples could be McDonald's or McDonald's Golden Arches uh, or the Coca-Cola uh, bottle or the Mercedes-Benz logo or the front grill on a Rolls-Royce or even the restaurant motif for a restaurant, uh, the one that made it to the Supreme Court was over Taco Cabana. Those of you that live in Texas and the Southwest are familiar with what Taco Cabana is. So we have four kinds of intellectual property. Let's go on to the next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. So as indicated earlier with the McDonald's and Coca-Cola examples, a product or a service, so keep those in mind, a product is like Coca-Cola, the beverage, a service is the Coca-Cola company, can have several different kinds of intellectual property protection. It can be a trade secret, such as the Coca-Cola formula. It can have uh, patent protection, such as the machines that make the Coca-Cola syrup or the design of the Coca-Cola bottle. It can have copyright protection for the Coca-Cola advertisements or songs. 
and it can have a trademark protection for the name, like Coca-Cola or, again, the bottle design. And one thing most people don't know is the little robust uh, tubby Santa Claus figure that we all associate with Christmas was actually a character that was created in the early 1900s by Coca-Cola. So the image we all think of Santa Claus originally originated with Coca-Cola. Okay, next slide, please. So our intellectual property rights are based upon British common law, as is most of the law in our country. Uh, you generally, and I'm going to say generally a couple of times throughout this presentation, generally you have to register patents, copyrights, or trademarks at the national government level. However, in the U.S., trademarks can also be filed at the state or a territory like Guam or Puerto Rico level as well, but then your rights are restricted primarily to just those areas. Given today with the use of the Internet and global television, even having a registration at the state's right, at the state level, uh, really gives you a lot of protection because you can't run an ad on the Internet and say, I don't want this ad to appear in New York because I'd be infringing on somebody's rights. But state rights are not as strong as the federal rights. Going back to patents, generally patent rights run for 20 years from the filing date of the patent. And that's one of the reasons why pharmaceutical drugs are so expensive, because they only get 20 years to use them before it becomes generic, and they may use up a large portion of those years just getting the drug approved and out into the market. Copyright protection, again, if you write a book or something like that, for unpublished work generally runs for 70 years after the death of the author, 95 years if it's a corporate author, or 120 years from the creation. But trademark rights, unlike patents and unlike copyrights, can exist forever. If you continue to use the mark in the manner in which it was registered and you continue to renew it every 10 years, you can have a trademark that lasts forever. Next slide. So a little bit on patents. Um, the right to uh, your exclusive use for an intervention is for a certain number of years provided that you disclose the patent or the invention to the public. So that's one of the downsides of a patent is you have to tell everybody what you have. Um, a patent will include a number of claims that define the patent and patents are assigned by the patent office into classes. And we're going to see this class idea coming back in trademarks as well. They're assigned in classes such as class 126 is stoves and furniture, uh, furnaces, uh, class 5 is beds, class 3 is amusement devices such as games. And usually patents are not assigned into multiple classes because a patent is a unique uh, feature that what works on a stove is not going to be something that you're going to find in a bed or in an amusement game. And uh, the cost to obtain a U.S. patent will run about $20,000 to over $100,000 to get it perfected, to get it finished. It'll take a couple of years, uh, two years minimum. And if you want to get a global plat patent, uh, mainly in all of the what I'll call civilized countries of the world, the U.S., European U Union, most of Southeast Asia and China, you're probably going to spend around a million dollars and take four or five years to get that patent filed. Next slide, please. So as you saw, patents are for a specific period of time, usually in discrete classes. Trademarks, on, or excuse me, copyrights on the other hand, are filed at the Copyright Office and are usually done through an online application. Uh, you can copyright almost any creative work. Uh, they are less expensive to obtain. It's usually less than $50 in filing fees, and there's no review uh, that takes place over it. They pretty much go on what's the face value, face validity of what you uh, submit in your application. Um, and they take about two to three months to process. And if you had never read a book like uh, Lord of the Flies or Harry Potter, never read it, never heard about it, and on your own you sat down and wrote Harry Potter or Lord of the Flies or Moby Dick, you could get a copyright on that because that was a creative original work of yours. And uh, that's an important thing about copyrights. That's why they're at such a low standard because two people can actually have copyrights on the exact same item if they both created it themselves. Next slide, please. But trademarks are much more complex. 
Uh, trademarks run, rights run from the first to use the mark, are common law rights, and federal trademarks run from the first to use the mark in interstate commerce, that is commerce between one state and the other. Just like as in America we have common law marriage where if you live with somebody for a certain number of years you can legally have rights to that person's property, likewise we have common law trademark rights where you don't have to register the name but you have to be the first one to use it, uh, you get uh, rights to that name. So we have this one nebulous con concept of first person to use the rights in interstate commerce, use the mark. And the second is based upon this nebulous concept called likelihood of confusion in the eyes of the ordinary consumer. And that's really the key thing to keep in mind, is that you don't have to actually be confused, and you, all you have to have is the likelihood that they may be confused, and it is the ordinary consumer in most instances. It isn't just saying, well, doctors aren't confused, but lay people are. It's the average intelligent person in America. Next slide, please. On top of that, there are things called famous marks that are generally recognized by the average consumer household, such as Viagra or Google or Exxon or Kodak or NASCAR. And these have broader rights because their mark has achieved such great fame. Last week, an opinion came down over a company wanted to use face mail and they were opposed by Facebook and it was an email type of service and Facebook hired the best trademark survey person in the country, a gentleman out in California, who did a survey that showed that 98 percent of the people he surveyed associated face, they knew who Facebook was. That is a huge claim to a mark being famous that 98 percent of the people in the country uh, recognize, uh, associate that mark, and a very high percentage of the people thought that if their product was out called face mail, that it was made by Facebook. So here you have the general consuming public thinking that there may be confusion between face mail and Facebook. Trademarks also are protected against dilution, famous trademarks I should say, are protected against diluting of their mark through what's called blurring or tarnishment. Um, blurring is where a gentleman came up with a clothing store for uh, gay men and called it Victor's Secret and was sued by Victoria's Secret. Uh, he actually won the case but it resulted in a change in our laws to protect uh, companies from that type of uh, blurring where a consumer isn't quite sure did Victoria's Secret come out with a gay, a gay men's clothing line or not. Uh, that's blurry, so sort of look at it the idea like a Fresnel lens, it blurs your image. And tarnishment, tarnishment is where your name is disparaging of, of a famous mark. And the classic one of that, we all are familiar with the board game Candyland, uh, there was a, a pornographic website that was called Candyland. That's tarnishing. You can only do uh, dilution of blurring and tarnishment on famous marks, you can, so you have to prove your mark is famous to get these enhanced rights. There isn't a list of famous marks. Marks uh, can be declared famous by courts uh, through evidence that's presented and marks can lose their fame. And so, uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, marks that were famous at one time but aren't uh, famous anymore. Uh, think back, if some of you are old enough, if in 1981 or so I had said I have an apple, uh, you would have thought a piece of fruit. Uh, now you think a computer. Or if I said I use Windows, you'd probably ask me do I have Anderson or Pella uh, or Marvin not uh, thinking software. So those have both become famous marks over time. Next slide please. Trademarks, remember we talked about the patents, how patents are in classes. Well trademarks also are in classes, um, but these classes overlap. So I gave you examples like class one is chemicals and class two is paints. Well, paints have chemicals in them, so a mark could be registered in class one in chemicals and two in paints. It could be registered in class nine, which is the largest class, electrical and scientific apparatus, because all of our technology is in there. You'll find in class nine everything from contact lenses to microscopes to computer software, memory boards, monitors, and TVs, all in the same class. 
And likewise, you could have a thermostat software be in class 9 and the actual thermostat being in class 11 for advertising and business services. Classes 1 through 35 are for products, as you can see, chemicals, paints, there's clothing, paper goods, and so forth. And classes 36 to, I think it's about 45 now, are services. So class 35 is advertising and business services. 36 is financial and insurance services, where you would find marks like Merrill Lynch or uh, Wells Fargo or uh, Fidelity. Uh, class uh, 38 is communication services. That's where you'll find things like Verizon and um, uh, AT&T. Class 41 is education and entertainment services. And there's uh, legal services and so forth. And again, these overlap. Marks can be registered in multiple classes, and that's very common to find a mark registered in multiple classes. Think of a mark that you associate a lot. Let's say uh, the uh, uh, Tony the Tiger. Well, he's on breakfast cereals. Uh, we have Tony the Tiger on clothing. We have him on board games. There's a variety of ways that you would find Tony the Tiger. Uh, next mark. Next uh, slide, please. So there's a couple of different types of marks. There are word marks, such as the word McDonald's. There are design marks, like you see on the left, McDonald's arches. And then there's what's called composite marks, which include both the word and the design, as you see on the right. Three different types of marks that you file for, three different types of, uh, three different applications you have to go for, all for exactly the same mark, uh, selling food. Next slide, please. So trademarks are evaluated as to their strength. And there's a couple of different kinds of strength, but I'm going to uh, talk about the ones here that are most relevant to us. The stronger the trademark, the greater the protections. And there are five types of names that are used to describe a mark's strength. The uh, best kind of a mark is called a fanciful mark. And that's a made-up term such as Exxon or Viagra or Verizon or Accenture. Uh, these are uh, the strongest marks and are referred to as being inherently strong or inherently distinctive marks, meaning on their own they have strength. The, the name Exxon was generated when one of the Standard Oil divisions uh, was spun off in the, I don't know, 20 years ago or so. And they had to come up with a new name for the company. So they knew that the double X was not used in any language anywhere in the world. So they had a computer generate several thousand names that were four, five, six, and seven letters long, I believe was it, that all had a double X in it because they needed a mark that they could use globally. And they came up with the name Exxon. Uh, Viagra, again, has no meaning at all, or Verizon. Uh, Verizon was the old general telephone and electronics company. So those are always going to be your strongest marks, the best marks. They're going to be the ones that are going to be easiest to clear and the ones that are going to be easiest to protect. They are the hardest ones to come up with, though. The second type of mark is called an arbitrary mark. This is where you take a dictionary term and you apply it to a new concept, such as Apple for computers or Lotus for software. These marks also can be inherently strong. They're just not quite as strong as a fanciful mark is. Um, so, uh, and if a mark wasn't famous, like Apple, you could actually have Apple jeans or sweatshirts, but Apple has sort of taken that over now. Uh, the third type of strength in a mark is what's called the suggestive marks. And these marks provoke an image or thought in the, in the consumer's mind, and they get your mind setting of thinking a certain way. So good examples of suggestive marks our igloo for ice chest, it pr promotes this concept of ice and cold. Holiday Inn for a hotel or motel services. And uh, these also can become strong marks uh, if they have been around long enough and they've acquired uh, a good enough what's called acquired distinctiveness. So if you look at the very first bullet there under fanciful marks, they're called inherently distinctive. They're distinctive on their own. Suggestive marks can be called acquired distinctiveness. Over time, they acquire distinctiveness. So if I ask you what brand of ice chest is that, and you say an igloo, you know exactly what it is. Next slide, please. And by the way, all three of those, 
uh, fanciful, arbitrary, and suggestive can all be registered without a problem, assuming that nobody else is a senior user to that mark. The last kind of mark that can be registered is called a descriptive mark. And these are the weakest ones for which you can obtain a registration. And they have different kinds of registration procedures for descriptive marks. But it's where the mark describes what it is used for, such as Seems like Bob's having some technical difficulties, so we'll give it a few minutes and hopefully he can reboot and rejoin. So in the meantime, just uh, hold on for a second and I'll reach out to him via email. Again, for those of you who may just joined us, Bob is having some technical difficulties. I just and it looks like he's back. Okay. Very good. You hear me now? Yep, we got you, Bob. Okay. Good. Let's so let's go back. Sorry about that, folks. I don't know what happened. It's a good thing we pay for the internet service, though, isn't it? <laughs> All right, let's put that uh, slide back up if we can. So, is it up there for them? It is. We should be on the slide entitled More on Trademark Strength Great. with the bullet points descriptive and generic marks. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, like I said, Bloomingdale's Big Brown Bag became uh, is very well known, as, especially among women shoppers. Uh, so you took a, a descriptive phrase that described what the bag is. It's a big brown bag. And because it has been used for so many years, it has obtained what is known as acquired distinctiveness. It's actually almost a famous trademark. And the last one there is called generic trademarks. And these are marks that are incapable of registration because they would deprive competitors of the use of a commonly used term. So an example of a term that you cannot register would be like modem or email or table or tire or boat. In fact, there used to be a uh, registration years ago for the word internet. The Internet Society owned it. But now that it's become so famous, Nobody could talk if we had to give or run any advertisements if we had to give the Internet Society a nickel for every time we use the word Internet. So it has become a generic phrase now to describe a global telecommunications system. Um, generic marks can be, generic words can be part of a trademark. They just can't be the whole trademark. And if you have a generic word in your trademark, then you just have to disclaim ownership to that generic term. Uh, that may be more complex than you need to know right now, but we will, we'll come back to that. All right, let's go on to the next slide then, please. All right, so generic terms can, or trademarks can become generic terms. And through either uh, negligence on the part of the owner or through no fault of the owner's uh, uh, trademark owner, a mark may become generic over time. And this list, which I hope you can see, are some of the marks that were one-time registered trademarks but are now generic terms. Um, and so things like aspirin, cellophane, dry ice, laundromat, thermos, uh, zipper, 
videotape, honey brown beer, urgent care, uh, gold card, call forwarding, uh, baby oil, Murphy bed, yellow pages, light beer, and fresh organics were all registered trademarks at one time but have become generic. And companies fight very hard to stop their marks from becoming generic. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So uh, the way they do this is uh, it's called genericide when trademarks are losing their uh, trademark registration or trademark rights and uh, companies try to block it. So Kleenex uh, tries to always remind attorneys to remind their clients that it's a brand of facial tissue. Uh, you request a facial tissue and you may get a Kleenex or you may get a Puffs brand. Uh, but we all say that. I, you have a Kleenex and I may hand you a Puffs. Uh, and companies try to stop that when they can. It's just hard. Uh, Xerox is another one. Uh, Xerox is a brand or a method for making a photocopy. Uh, you make a photocopy of a recipe on a Xerox copier. You don't Xerox a recipe. And the last one is Rolls-Royce. It's a brand of an automobile. You drive a Rolls-Royce automobile, but there is no such thing as the Rolls-Royce of ballpoint pens. Although Rolls-Royce may license or make a ballpoint pen bearing the Rolls-Royce name. And um, so you need to always watch that out there. And those of us in the trademark bar are really more sensitive of it, of these kinds of issues. Um, okay, so uh, let's go on to the next slide, please. So I've given you some overview on, on trademarks and patents and copyrights. And now let's talk about the important thing is how do you create a clean trademark? When I got in the trademark business uh, 1993, there were less than 100,000 registered trademarks at the trademark office and less than a million total applications had ever been filed there. There's over 2 million applications now that have been filed and there's about a million registered marks. But to make things even worse, in 1990 when I first got involved with the internet and domain names and the conflict with trademarks, there were only 98,000 dot coms in the entire world and there's now somewhere around 350 million dot coms so your hard part is going to be not only coming up with a good name but finding a name that also works on the internet so there isn't a simple way to come up with a clean trademark the internet has created a global market where some of the more obvious good names were obvious to somewhere somewhere else in the world and they may be using it and that's a problem that all of us have to deal with, is that there are way more people using domain names or squatting on those domain names than there are uh, you owning a trademark that goes with it. But they keep us from being able to market. And I'll talk to you about some alternatives in that in a little bit. Uh, depending upon your business model, uh, internet access may or may not be an issue uh, if there's a senior user of that particular domain name in England or if the user were in Mexico or Canada. So if you're making some, you've got a restaurant chain and you're going to be only in the central United States or maybe only on the West Coast, it may not bother you that somebody else already owns that trademark or owns the domain name and is in London if you can come up with a domain name that works for you. But if you're planning on taking your company global and you think it one day may go global or your paths may cross with the other company because um, you're both selling the same kind of products over the internet, then you have to be aware of somebody like who's in England. Next slide, please. So to generate a new name, a new trademark, there are companies that provide this for a fee. Uh, they usually include focus groups, which I don't think are all that great, but they do. And I'll give you some ideas, an example of one. Years ago, there was a company called Compact Computer. Uh, we all probably remember it. Uh, they were bought by Hewlett Packard. Compact paid six million dollars to have their name made by a business in California called Name Lab. And that was done in the early 1980s or so, uh, mid 1980s. The name was neat because it was the first portable computer. It was Compact, C-O-M-P-A-C-T. So they made up a word, C-O-M-P-A-Q, that pronounced like the suggestive word Compact, only they ended up with an arbitrary mark. So you can get companies that will actually make a name for you, or you can do it yourself. And I happen to like doing it myself when I can. Um, so the first thing I try to do is to develop a suggestive mark if I can. And that is, 
I want to plant the thought in the mind of the consumer of what I want to do. And so, for instance, uh, the example I gave here is like peace of mind for clothing. Uh, peace of mind for a holistic health service or a food company or a doctor's office or a psychiatrist, never going to cut it because there's probably a hundred people out there using the phrase peace of mind for those kinds of services. That's where it would naturally fit. But to put peace of mind on clothing, that becomes incongruous and it suggests that if I wear these clothing, this clothing, I'm going to be relaxed and comfortable. I'm going to feel better. I'm going to have peace of mind. So you could have a suggestive mark that puts an image in the customer's mind that you want to project out to that customer. Or you could develop an, odd, an arbitrary mark, which is incongruous use of words. Examples I give you are hog's breath in, Clint Eastwood's famous uh, bar and restaurant. Uh, hog's breath, uh, we all have this connotation of something foul smelling, sort of like a old bar does after the beer has been spoiled. Uh, it's an arbitrary mark. He took normal words and put it into a different application. Another example is to, another way is to make up words, and the way you can do that is to use translations, uh, find out what a word means in another uh, language. Uh, there was a, used to be a very good restaurant in New York uh, called Un de Trois. Uh, their address was 123, I don't know, 46th Street or something like that, 43rd Street. So they took the, le the numbers and put it into French, Un de Trois, and uh, came up with a trademark for their restaurant. Um, the thing you have to remember about foreign translations, though, is that for registration purpose in the United States, those foreign words will be converted into English, and then it will be determined whether or not that English version uh, conflicts with somebody else's mark. Another example is to combine prefixes and suffixes together. An uh, example I showed is GoPro. The first use of GoPro I ever heard was for golf professionals. Uh, it was a marketing service for golf professionals uh, called take the first two letters of go of golf go first three letters of professional pro we now have gopro on cameras we've got gopro on everything in the world i don't think you could register gopro for very much anymore uh, without either stepping on somebody else's rights or just having a, a not real strong mark but you can take pieces of words and put them together and form a mark which works real well and another thing to do is to review synonyms and homonyms and intentional misspellings of a word and see if you can generate a word that way. And what I'm going to do next is show you a couple of examples of marks that I did where we actually did this. So both of these uh, took me less than 10 hours to do. The first one was for a company in Austin, Texas that was called The Auto Club. And they were in a lawsuit with uh, California AAA over use of the auto club. And we ended up reaching a settlement, settlement with them because I was able to show that there were over 500 different organizations in America that call themselves, uh, they have auto club in the name, like the Porsche Auto Club or the Harvard Alumni Auto Club or the Vintage Automobile Auto Club. We were able to show that nobody really owns the words auto club. But part of the settlement was that we had to come up with a new name for our company. Uh, for this guy's company I was working for. And so I, uh, I began, I came up with uh, Paragon Motor Club for him. Uh, Paragon because that means excellence or peak or the summit, so it's suggestive. It gives an image of the top of the line. And then I replaced Auto Club with Motor Club. And we came up with a very good mark. Uh, they still provide the same kind of services. And ironically, we were able to uh, get ParagonMotorClub.com as a domain name for him. And that all just came about by me using my head and trying to think what's the image he wants to project and what does he do. And so Paragon Motor Club worked real well. For me, my company is called Illuminor. Um, I'll tell you, my first company, big company I had in New York was called Core Search, where we would, the concept was you go to the core of a computer and you're doing a research project on names. And so you go into the core and doing a search. So we called it C-O-R-S-E-A-R-C-H. We made up a word. We dropped the E off of core. Uh, that business is still in existence 30 years now. Or Illuminor, my company now, uh, what I did is I, I, I made a list of all the synonyms that describe what I do. I said I provide, I'm a guide, I, I'm a mentor, I advise, I help, I assist. 
And uh, I was going through all those. I did them. I looked at those same words in French and English and Latin and Spanish. I tried combining the prefixes of one with the suffix of another. I uh, wasn't really having a whole lot of luck. Then I started to look at synonyms and antonyms and homonyms. And one of the synonyms I found was to illuminate. For, that's a, uh, a synonym for uh, to, uh, to mentor, to illuminate. And I thought, wow, that's good. But illuminate sounds like a lighting company. So I dropped the A-T-E suffix. I added an O-R. I created a word now called illuminor. And I now have a fanciful mark. Maybe it's suggestive. It uh, might be a little bit, except Illuminor isn't a, a word. And uh, if you go to my website, you'll see at Illuminor.com that I have a beacon uh, on it, a lighthouse beacon uh, that rotates around to give you that idea of the shining light, the, gu the guiding light. Uh, that's what I wanted to get across. Now, I talked about domain name problems at the beginning. Some cyber squatter owned Illuminor.com. And I uh, wanted to sell it to me for $5,000. I didn't want to do that. So I first uh, registered my name, Illuminor, and then I took Illuminor LLC, because that's what I am, IlluminorLLC.com was an available domain name, and so I became IlluminorLLC.com. Very common to have that happen. And then I waited for the cyber squatter to give up use of the name and let another squatter take it. And when he did that, my trademark rights now became senior over the new domain name owner, and I was able to force the new domain name owner to give me Illuminor.com. I didn't have to pay a nickel for it. I think I paid $50 to GoDaddy to get it processed. So there's ways if somebody does have your uh, name, you can get it back if you have a trademark rights that are er earlier or better. So that's two examples of how you can create a name uh, in uh, whole, not a whole lot of time just by using your brain. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a screenshot of the Illuminor website, and you get the idea. Even on the word Illuminor on the upper left, I follow through with the uh, beacon uh, light because uh, that's what I want to get the uh, point across to my clients. So let's go on to the next slide. Uh, I have a name that I like. Now what do I do? Uh, you'll see the first two. It looks like I made a typo, but I didn't. First, do not fall in love with the name. And the second point. Do not fall in love with the name. I can't emphasize this enough to you. Don't fall in love with the name. Don't print any business cards. Don't print any stationery. Don't open any bank accounts. Don't fall in love with the name until you're sure that the name is available. I can't tell you how many companies I wrestle with where the family or the owner has gotten completely committed to a, gay, a name. They've invested thousands of dollars in printing up stuff and getting ads and all this stuff only to find out that they're infringing on somebody else's mark. So let's go to the next slide. So what do I do? First thing, go check it on the internet. Uh, used advanced searching if needed for prefixes and close approximating of wor approximation of words. Uh, you can do that on Google and on Yahoo. Um, if it's a consumer product uh, that you see that is um, uh, that you're going to make, uh, go to retailers who make products similar to what you're going to be competing with and look over all of their product inventories. Go to their websites. See what the people who are going to be your competitors are marketing their products as. Look at their colors. Look at their packaging. Look at their pricing. And then look at the, the domain name that you would want to use and see if you can find a domain name. So what you're doing is you're putting the pieces together. I'm gonna, I got a great name. Illuminor. I now want to go on the internet, do a Google or Yahoo search, and see who's using Illuminor or using anything close to that. I L L U M I N as a prefix, because I M I N O R or A R or E R all pronounce the same. Remember what we're dealing with: likelihood of confusion in the eyes of the consumer. Then I'm going to check and see what my competitors might be doing. Then I'm going to look and see if I can get a domain name that works. And then I highly recommend you get a professional name availability search completed. There's only two or three companies in the world that do all of this. The company I used to own, Core Search, is one of them. Um, they uh, will search a name for you, and they cover s sources of information that you don't have access to and I don't have access to. Uh, search costs about $800. And uh, you need to be able to tell the search firm what you want to use this far. So you say, I, I want to use the boss for 
uh, pillows and, and bedding or for management consulting services or whatever. And they'll get a search done for you in about a week, uh, four or five days, and then either somebody like myself or an attorney needs to review that and see what kind of uh, problems came up in the search. Next page. You can go to the USPTO website. Uh, the website link is there, uh, where you can conduct you can conduct screening searches on the names, but that does not cover common law use or states. It only gives you an idea of what's available at the federal end. And again, remember that this has very limited searching capabilities. It's made for lay people to do their searches. It won't do phonetic equivalents that a professional search firm will do. So in trademark in the trademark world. Q-U-I-C, Q-U-I-K, Q-U-I-X, K-W-I-C, K-W-I-K, K-W-I-X are all the same word, quit. All right? So don't think that because you did a corrupted spelling or intentionally misspelled a word that that gives you something over somebody else who's using a very similar name. The, the law is corrupted spellings and intentionally misspelled are uh, researched of on the basis of the correct spelling. Next slide. After you've completed all your research and you think you have solidified in your mind the goods and services under which you're going to market the pro trademark and how you're going to market your goods, spend an hour or two with somebody who knows something about trademark infringement, which is different than knowing something about trademarks. And I'm going to show you why in a little bit. I get a report each month of all the trademark oppositions that are filed at the trademark office. When you file your application at the trademark office, once the examiner makes sure that the mark is okay from their perspective, they then post it in a book uh, once a month, every week a uh, new listing comes out for the public to oppose this, uh, meaning that somebody may not like your particular mark, but they don't have a registration for their mark. They're opposing you on common law grounds. There's over 7,000 oppositions filed a year just there, and there's about another 6,000 trademark infringement lawsuits filed every year. So uh, just because your attorney is a family friend and he know, went and took a trademark law class in school doesn't mean he knows anything at all about trademark infringement. Maybe knows how to file an application, but there's a difference between filing the application and getting a registration, as I'm going to show you on the next slide. I call this, don't become a WWTT. WWTT is what were they thinking? I want you to look over this list of marks. These are all marks that this year somebody applied to register. Man of Steel, Hulk Mash, Skanky Yankees, Stake of the Sea, Powerhouse, Quick Draw Productions, Sox Monsters, Dorothy, and Jaegerbaum. Now, I look at each one of those, and I'll see how you all can think on your own. When I think of Man of Steel, I think of Superman and Marvel Comics. And so you better darn well believe, I don't care what you want to use Mar Man of Steel on, Superman and Marvel Comics are going to oppose it. When I see Hulk smash, I know that the Hulk, uh, the action figure, again, Marvel Comics, is going to come after you. If they don't, Hulk Hogan might. Skanky Yankees, I can tell you... I can guarantee to you, if you use any major league baseball team's mascot for any kind of product anywhere in America, a law firm in New York uh, that represents major league baseball will oppose your registration. So if you have a, you're out in Hawaii and you're on a cove called Pirates Cove and you want to put a bar there and call it Pirates Cove Bar, they will oppose you and make sure that you don't do anything at all at that restaurant that could possibly be confusing with uh, the Pittsburgh Pirates or which may cause confusion with the Pittsburgh Pirates. Uh, that's why they oppose skanky Yankees. Steak of the Sea, we all see uh, Chicken of the Sea. We know exactly who's going to not like that. Powerhouse, it's going to be Powerhouse Jims. Uh, Quick Draw Productions, Quick Draw McGraw, Hanna-Barbera, the ca cartoon character. Uh, Jaegerbaum, uh, probably some of you have had some Jaegermeister in your days and know what a Jaegerbaum is and you better believe it. You, you Jaeger something, Jaegermeister is going to complain. Dorothy, are we in Kansas yet? Uh, you can't register Dorothy without the Wizard of Oz folks coming after you. 
And Sox Monster, again, is going to be Major League Baseball uh, because of the, uh, either the Red Sox or the White Sox. One of those are going to come after you. So all of these were trademarks that were filed after an attorney had approved it. They all made it through the trademark office and now were opposed by somebody. Because in the trademark office, Man of Steel is not registered for what the person wanted to use it for, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, isn't a famous mark in people's minds. So go to the next slide. And these are some of those who seem to want to oppose everything. Major League Baseball is one of the biggest. Uh, monster Beverages. You put Monster on anything, Monster Beverages is going to oppose. It doesn't mean they're going to win. It simply means that they're going to oppose to get you to agree to certain conditions so you don't infringe upon their marks. Trek Bicycle will come after anybody who's using TREK on anything. Uh, the NFL, just like Major League Baseball, NCAA, and all the colleges. You think of all the college mascots. I don't care what you, if you could be living in New York and you want to call it Longhorn Beer, and I can tell you NCAA is going to come after you as will the University of Texas. And Apple likewise. Anything that's got an apple, a bite out of an apple, the apple color scheme, or the word apple, iPod, i in front of just about anything, will result in Apple um, objecting to it. Doesn't mean you can't get your mark registered, it just means you need to know what you're doing. So let's go on to the last slide here and then we'll take some questions for the last 10 minutes or so. In summary, there's four kinds of intellectual property, patents, copyrights, trade secrets, and trademarks. Uh, trade secrets are the only ones that are not registered because it is a secret. Uh, trademark rights are generally based upon this concept of first to use or first to file. And trademark infringement is generally based upon this nebulous concept of likelihood of confusion. Uh, there doesn't have to be actual confusion, just a chance that the consumer may be confused. Which you all are probably confused now. So let me tell you what you can do. Uh, my email address is bob at, uh, I'm sorry, bob underscore frank at Illuminor, I L L U M I N O R dot com. I should have put that on here. Feel free to zap me an email and say, hey, Bob, uh, here's my question. Listen to you today. I'll answer you or give you a call back and talk to you all I can and help you out as much as possible because this is anything but clear and uh, easy to understand. I'll take questions now. All right, thanks, Bob. Uh, I'll have Jim take a look out across the platforms and uh, see if there's any questions that have come through. I'd like to thank you for the, for the wealth of knowledge because I can say that we've had some other presentations on this topic and you've gone into depth and into areas that I think a lot of people would, would overlook. Um, while Jim's doing that, Bob, I want you to talk briefly about something else and uh, it's something I like to bring up and it's the work-life balance. I know you have a very unique hobby that you like to do. Um, and you said you'd be a specific place on August 18th. So if you could just briefly talk about kind of that work-life balance um, and the importance of that, because as you know, as an entrepreneur yourself, you know, the 20-hour work days, that type of thing, can really take a toll on you. So I just wanted to get your input on that. All right, good. I'll be glad to, Mike. I've given many presentations at universities on entrepreneurship. And one of the things I make entre all these uh, entrepreneur students do is I ask them all to stand up. And I said, every one of you that needs uh, over eight hours of sleep at night uh, in a week's period of time, sit down. And every one of you who uh, needs to have a family and friends close by or a wife or children, sit down. And every one of you who's not willing to risk everything that you own for the success of your company, sit down. And I go through about five questions like that. And then uh, the ones that are standing, I said, you all think you're the survivors because you're standing. And the fact is you're actually crazy because you're willing to give up everything that you can in order to become successful, but that's what it takes to be an entrepreneur. Um, so I will tell you that one of the things you do have to do is get a balance in your life, and that comes after, regretfully, you've gone through all the years of hard work. Uh, my balance is I'm also a scuba diving instructor, and uh, I scuba dive now. I'm, I've reached, I'm 62 years old, so I enjoy my life, and uh, I take four or five really good scuba diving trips a year, um, heading down to Costa Rica in two weeks. Uh, but my big thrill is teaching kids how to scuba dive because I love seeing that on their face, the excitement of it. And I also love working with veterans, especially those that are disabled, who can't imagine how I could possibly learn to scuba dive if I'm missing a leg or missing an arm. And yeah, we can teach you. 
I was just blown away when I was in Israel several years ago and saw how well they have taken their wounded veterans and brought them the thrill of scuba diving. Um, so it is important to get that balance in your life, but it's very hard when you're an entrepreneur. It's just a tough, it's a tough life. But if you have a good product, and one of the things I should have said earlier, would people come up with names? Imagine what went on in the boardroom of General Telephone, uh, GTE, when somebody came in and said, we're going to rename this company Verizon. And what I tell people is, if your company is successful, people will find you. And if your company is not successful, it doesn't matter what the name is. So if you have a good name, a clear name, so that you can differentiate yourself, and you have a good product or service you offer, the name actually will grow and people will learn who it is. I didn't think 30 years ago when I went to my found, my investors and said, we're starting a company called Core Search, and I told them what the name is, they all said, well, okay, let's see what happens. But now 30 years later, it is the second largest trademark research firm in the world. And now when I go around and people say, oh, you're the Bob Frank from Core Search. Well, that was a lot of years of effort to get that there, but the name survived. Thanks, Bob. Um, we have a question from Roman on G+. He says, what about using your own name? I'm a sole proprietor. Should I look for a separate business name, or could he use his own name and his, and his company title? Very good. Very good question. Uh, if your name is McDonald's, I wouldn't use it if I wanted to open up a restaurant or anything related to the foods. All right, you're going to have problems there. Uh, but there's a lot of great names out there in the trucking industry, like Hunt. Uh, was a family name, Bass Brothers, uh, they can become very good. There's nothing wrong with using your, your own name provided that, uh, well one thing is you will have some problems registering a surname. Uh, they generally, if it's a very common surname, uh, like Frank, you'll have a difficult time registering it. Uh, you, I could have a business called Frank's Franks that sells hot dogs and then I'd let the trademark office see how they wanted to handle that. Um, uh, it's sometimes it's a little harder uh, to register surnames, but there's nothing wrong with you using it. Just making sure that nobody else is using the same surname for their uh, their business, which may be a competitor of yours. Thanks, Bob. Um, and I don't see any other questions out there. So, as Bob mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, I've put his email address out on the group chat in uh, G Plus. Uh, Bob, if you're okay with it, we'll also put it out on the uh, the, the event page so Absolutely. people can reference that. Um, and you, you can ask Bob if you have specific questions after you get a chance to maybe watch or re-watch the event as a lot of information was covered. Um, with that being said, Bob, thanks again for going so in-depth on, on a very important part of the entrepreneurial process, especially one of those that is kind of addressed right out of the gate. Um, so was that, with that, thank you. Um, in as I always close these uh, these hangouts out up, I, I'd like to encourage all of you to check out the Institute for Veterans and Military Families website at vets.syr.edu and take a look at the educational programs that we, we are offering. Um, you know how we were connected with Bob, and again I have to thank him. Is there was a segment on 60 Minutes, and he saw our EBV program, and he had reached out, and he he asked how he could help. So we have a wealth of people who are of Bob's caliber, um, just willing to help you guys as veterans start your your ventures. So please check out what we have going on, and check out the rest of our VetNet hangouts that we have archived out on YouTube. So with that, Bob, do you have any closing? Uh, comments. My last thoughts would be if you do contact me, send me an email. If you've got a name that you're working on or uh, something, uh, send me the, what the name is and say, here's how I'm looking at using it. And that way I can do a little bit of research before I talk back to you. And um, second thing is, like I said, clear your name before you fall in love with it. Uh, that's very important to do. Uh, otherwise, you just won't believe how difficult it is to get people to change their name once they've got their mind set on it. And uh, third thing, I want to thank all of you guys for what you've done for our country. Uh, I'm a veteran. Uh, behind me on the wall here are several certificates I've gotten from the Wounded Warriors Project uh, for the work I do with them. So uh, I'm very appreciative of everything you all have done because you've given us a country that allows us to live the way we do. So bless to all of you. Thank you very much, Bob. And uh, thank you for all joining us. Keep a, uh, an eye out on the VetNet page, and we'll let you know of upcoming events. And with that being said, Bob, thanks again, and we'll hope to talk to you soon. Thank you all very much. Bye-bye.